good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Williamsburg Botanical Gardens Learn and Grow program for March of 2021. I am Judith Alberts, and I serve on the Gardens Board of Directors. A little bit of housekeeping. And yes, we are recording, and you will receive a link to the replay within 48 hours. It will be posted on YouTube. Please make sure that your microphone is turned off, and we recommend turning off your camera for privacy um, and closing other applications and devices so that uh, it does not interfere with the Zoom function. We'll be using the chat box for questions, and our speaker will answer them at the end. And if there are any technical glitches, just bear with us. To the regular garden visitors, volunteers, and learn and grow attendees, it's great to have you back with us again, and thank you. For first time guests, the first thing that we'd like you to know about the garden is that it is free to visit and it's open every day of the year from 7 a.m. until dusk. And one of the um, frequently asked questions is, are dogs allowed? And my answer is always, yes, canines may bring their well-behaved humans on a leash. The garden is very small. It's only two or two and a half acres um, in what is actually a traffic circle on the road from the entrance of Freedom Park. And the parking lot is right over here. And this is the interpretive center where we used to hold these sessions live. We pack a lot into those two acres. There are 18 different types of habitat, including a wildflower meadow, woodlands, three different types of wetlands, a succulent rock garden, et cetera, et cetera. And coming this spring, we're going to have a new carnivorous plant display. We're pretty excited about that. The garden is intentionally more natural than what you would expect when you hear the words botanical garden. It's definitely not precisely manicured and it's not a collection of high maintenance plantings. It's more of a wild child with an emphasis on native plants and practices that are going to support wildlife and pollinators, such as this winter scene where standing stems are left during the winter, providing food and habitat. This sign up here shows that it is officially registered as a monarch, monarch butterfly way station. We are number 3394. The garden's mission is to demonstrate environmentally responsible and sustainable gardening and to offer education on related topics. Everything in the garden is tended by a core of dedicated volunteers and we do it on a slim budget. So yes, here comes the pitch. We are a nonprofit C501 C3 or corporation, and we receive no funding from any level of government. Our learn and grow programs are free. And as I mentioned, we used to have them live and in person at the interpretive center. And of course there was a donations jar at the registration table. So we have gone to a virtual donations jar and your follow-up email will include a handy dandy link. If you'd like to support the garden further, please consider a membership, which is available on our website. Now you can shop uh, at Brent and Becky's Bulbs in Gloucester. They ship everywhere all over the United States. And then when you start at bloomandbucks.com, you, um, your purchase will support the nonprofit of your choice. And of course, hope, we hope that you will support the Williamsburg Botanical Garden, along with your purchases on smile.amazon.com. And I am really excited about this because we started monitoring our Amazon Smile metrics about nine months ago. And we had all of five supporters and I was one of them. Um, and we are now, as of March 18th, we went from 23 to 24, and it shows you how much we have actually received. So this was a three month donation, and it just grows bit by bit, every little, every little penny helps. The Wilmsburg Botanical Garden is on Facebook, and if you raise monarch butterflies, we invite you to join us on the Milkweed Connection. 
Uh, we have also recently started using Instagram. We're, we're not entirely adept at that yet, and I forgot to include that slide. Our learn and grow, oh, and we're on YouTube. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a frog in my throat. Uh, learn and grow programming will remain virtual until further notice. And here's what's coming up in April. We're going to learn about snakes and toads and other amphibious visitors in the garden with Megan Thomas, who is a certified wildlife biologist with the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. May, Patsy McGrady, who is a master gardener and tree steward, is going to talk to us about volcano mulching and other tree crimes. In June, Dr. Sean T. Dash, who's an assistant professor um, at Hampton University, is going to tell us all about cicadas. And before I introduce today's speaker, just a reminder, master gardeners and master naturalists may claim this session as continuing education. Today's program is about the wonders of composting. And our speaker is Justin Lewis Diaz, who comes from a family of avid home vegetable and flower gardeners. He's the proprietor of Mockingbird Farmstead, a half acre market garden with plots around Williamsburg, Virginia, and he offers seasonal farm shares and pastured egg deliveries. He started mocking, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Oh, so, so, excuse me. He started Mockingbird Farmstead in late 2015 to share his love of great homegrown produce uh, conveniently and affordably with the community. You'll also find Mockingbird Farmstead on Instagram and on YouTube. In 2017, Justin uh, took the Master Gardener program. He's the class of 2018. Uh, that way it allows him to share his passion for growing along with his passion for educational outreach, which he also uh, shares with other local farmers and community education programs in his role as the assistant manager of the Williamsburg Farmers Market. So thank you and welcome to Justin Lewis Diaz. I am stopping my share and take it away, Justin. Hello, everybody. I'm going to start my share here. Let's just make sure we have everything up and running okay. Okay, and you're good to go. Should be up. Great. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Um, thank you, Judith and uh, the Botanical Garden for having me and for doing these talks. I think they're very valuable and I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, my name is Justin Luis Diaz. Today's, um, today's talk, I'm just going to be going through a little bit about uh, an intuitive way to understand and apply composting to your particular context, whether it's a, a market garden such as I'm doing, or it's your home gardens or community gardens. Um, hopefully there will be something there for, for everybody. Um, I will say just a couple of things before we get started. Um, if somehow for some reason, it sounds like, or I say something like, the only way you're supposed to do this, just discount that, <laughs> discount that immediately. If what you're doing works for you, I strongly encourage you to keep doing it. I hope that by listening to me and uh, sharing in, in a slightly different perspective, there may be a nugget there for uh, of information for you to take back with you and, and help you uh, in your personal context. Um, I'm just always wary of, of people trying to uh, tell you there's only one right way to do something, especially with gardening and growing plants. I find that that's one of the least true things uh, about it. So um, let's keep that in mind also. Um, if there are questions about what brands or particular types of things I like to use, I will share with you the products that I use, but please do not uh, construe those as endorsements or advertisements in, in any way. They're not, they're just, they're just what I happen to use and I'm happy to make, make uh, to make recommendations for you. So before we get into the meat of the presentation, I would just like to give a little bit more context about 
um, what my experience with composting is and uh, what I use it for in, in my day-to-day -day life. Um, so here we have just, this is one of the, what our compost piles look like on the farm. I have uh, my, my composting, my high precision composting thermometer in there. It's a, it's a long thermometer that you would use in like a turkey fryer. It's, uh, you know, 16 inches long or something like that. And I just, we're trying to get a, a good temperature reading on, on the, the heart of the compost pile. Um, I think you can see from the outside that uh, we have very fresh, uh, fresh components in there. The leaves are still green. There's some hay or straw in there from a clean out from our chicken coop on the farm. And um, so it's only maybe two or three days old and the thermometer is hovering somewhere around 125 degrees. <clears throat> so what we're, what we're trying to do in this instance is hot composting. Um, and that's what I'll be focusing on in terms of trying to build an understanding uh, in terms of tackling, uh, tackling complexities and in terms of understanding the theory behind composting, because uh, really that's where most people struggle. There are many, many kinds of composting. Um, I will have uh, a table with all kinds of different different ways to compost available on my website. Um, and maybe Judith, Judith can, can post that also. Uh, on the botanical garden site, but um, just for you to, to check out or, or or do your own research and 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 look into some some unique and interesting ways that might better suit your your personal context. Um, most other forms of con of composting rely on a method where we put things in a pile and then come back to that pile far in the future, months or or years later, where where there's not a lot of active work. Um, the hot composting method that we'll be going into greater detail about, again, it is a more active composting thing, and we can start with the constituents in uh, week one, and by week four, we can have usable compost. And that's, uh, in my particular context, as a market gardener, that is, that's what I need. I need, I need the compost quickly. I need the maximum nutrient density in that compost, which is one of the benefits of hot composting. Um, and I also have a lot of, you know, I got a lot of chicken poop, honestly, and we got to do something with that. So, um, so let's, let's, let's keep a pin in that. Um, short term, we'll be understanding the composting process. Um, mid term, medium term would be uh, using or leveraging our understanding of that composting process to support soil life. So in this image, um, this is a head of Napa cabbage and uh, a bunch of weeds. They're our second most profitable crop are the weeds that we grow on the farm. Um, but what we can see in the soil here is uh, we see some, uh, a lot of soil life. We see mycorrhizal fungi in these white patches. And um, we can see the the threads of the fungi, you know, kind of creeping through there. They look similar to roots, but are, are, are somewhat more fuzzy uh, and more feathery. Here we go. That's mycorrhizal fungi. We'll talk about what that is and the role it plays. And we see little little peaks of our, our dear, dear friends, earthworms here and here. And this is, obviously, I, I couldn't know that there were earthworms under this particular head. We just kind of tilted this a, a few days um, before harvest for a farm share. We kind of tilted it to the side to just check and make sure everything was doing okay. Um, we see these formations over here and those small round, um, I guess we'll, we'll call them globules. Um, these are very characteristic of worm activity. It's worm poop. Um, and that is something that we love to see on the soil surface, this little thing here. It shows that there's a lot of life uh, happening under the soil surface. And that is what is providing uh, the fertility to my farm and what the benefits of composting are. It's, it's food for the soil food web. So we'll, we'll talk about that also. Um, longer term, this is, this is the goal. So um, this is a shot from a year ago of one of our farm plots. And what we have is we have three stages of soil present. And so um, in the foreground uh, near, near this black tarp here, we have the path. 
and this is before we mulch the path and get everything together. This is, um, this is late spring, I'm sorry, late winter. Um, and on the path, we can see it's almost like a, a baseball diamond type dirt. It's a silty, sandy loam. It's very light in color. It's very dusty. There's not a lot of nutrients in it. And this is what the native soil on the plot was. Um, if we draw a line right, right around here, everything to the left of center has had two seasons through it. And by seasons, I mean, we have two years of very high rotation growing on the farm. So what we're doing is um, high rotation crops in, in my particular context are crops that are grown and harvested within uh, about a month, about 28 days, four weeks in, the, in mid season is about what we expect. So um, the seeds are planted and 28 days later, we come through and harvest. And we keep doing that every 28 days. And we do that every 28 days for the entire growing season. We're putting a tremendous uh, amount of seeds in the soil. We're harvesting a tremendous amount of food from the soil. And what we still find is that when we use compost and we pay attention to the soil health, we find that the soil, the more, the more we grow food in the soil, the better the soil becomes. And that is absolutely the opposite of what we find in larger scale um, industrial farming applications. And this is not, I'm not anti-industrial farming either. This is not a commentary on that. This is just about what we're doing and why I enjoy promoting it and, and the value that I find in it. And then lastly, we find over on the right where the soil is the darkest. This is uh, soil that has been worked for four, four seasons, high rotation for four seasons. It is the nicest, darkest, richest soil. It's the, we don't use fertilizers on our high rotation crops. We simply are using compost, Occasionally we will add wood chips if the situation permits and we continually are just putting the soil life and the soil structure first. And that is kind of the reward that, that we reap for that. So this area over here, you see it's visibly darker. Um, it is, it holds moisture better. It does everything you would want good, good garden soil to do. Um, and then this is what we get from it. These are some rows on the farm. This is um, one, one basically column over. Um, these are some of our spicy mustard mixes here. We have some turnips, a row of uh, Hakurai turnips here. We have lettuces growing under some shade cloth in the background and more spicy mix. These are the high rotation crops that I'm talking about. Um, when we're working the soil, we also, I'm not sure if, you, if you're able to tell these different varieties of uh, spicy mustard greens, but if you look between them, you will notice that there are no weeds either. And so, so there, there are lots of added benefits to promoting soil life in the way we do. Um, this is a, a longer shot of one of our other plots this is at a different plot um, and just more, more of our high rotation rows, a uh, little tiny greenhouse in the back and some cover crops here. We use cover crops, obviously. Um, cover cropping is maybe a talk I would like to do because there's a lot of applications uh, for the home gardener also, especially with beautiful cover crops like crimson clover um, or uh, let's see, hairy vetch are also very, very pretty uh, flowers and uh, buckwheat. So um, our six goals for, for this talk um, basically are um, we're going to understand the carbon, nitrogen, water, oxygen mantra, and that's... <clears throat> We'll see that in a second, but that's something we just to keep in mind. We're going to talk about decomposition, uh, understanding the soil food web and nutrient cyclers. That is one of the engines that that really powers this whole thing. Um, we'll talk about different composting si sty uh, styles, as specifically, again, as I mentioned earlier, hot composting. We're going to go through the nuts and bolts of composting, and then we're going to troubleshoot common problems. And this is very similar to uh, the class that I teach um, the composting class for the Master Gardener program. Uh, and usually we're in person, obviously. Um, but uh, I make a bet with someone that by the time we get to number six, troubleshooting common problems because of what we've established before will be an intuitive process for them. And everybody will have the answers to these by the time, by the time we get there. Um, I don't know if anybody's willing to take me up on that bet, but uh, I've 
I built a substantial fortune doing it. So um, the four knobs of composting. These are the elements that we will that we'll be turning to adjust or monitor or improve or slow down or overall control how our hot composting works. And again, we're going to talk about other types of composting later, but specifically with hot composting, um, carbon, nitrogen, water, and oxygen. And again, these are the knobs that we're going to be turning and they, they really um, impact most significantly the composting process. And so I just kind of, they're at the bottom of every slide for the rest of the presentation and they're, they're important. And I just really want that to always kind of be in the back of your mind as, as we're moving forward. And the fifth element also, but a good news, we get this for free, is the soil life. Uh, the soil life, these nutrient cyclers, um, the fungi, the bacteria that do the digesting of this plant material that make the nutrients within it uh, available for the things that we're trying to grow in it. Um, they're the true heroes. Composting does not work without soil life. There is no such thing as dead compost. It is inherently a living thing and a living process. So we're going to talk about soil life also. Um, really what we want to do is leverage these mixtures of carbon, nitrogen, water, and oxygen in composting purely to support the soil life. Um, so the wrong definition of composting, and uh, I, if, <laughs> it's uh, what I've done here is one of those like middle school presentation. Webster's Dictionary defines composting as uh, a mixture of various decaying organic substances as dead leaves or manure used for fertilizing soil. Um, a composition or a compound, well, that, that's not actually the definition that we're talking about. So in red, um, I have the words various and fertilizing highlighted. Um, we don't really consider compost to technically be a fertilizer. We consider it to be more of a soil amendment. And so fertilizing is not really wrong, but it's, it's less precise. Um, and a mixture of various decaying organic substances. Now, if it was once alive, it will decompose. So we understand that, but can we just really put any, anything in, in the compost? We can't. Um, the good news is though that we all actually already understand how all of these things work. So in, in this image we have uh, in the top left, we have the forest floor. It's leaves and branches and twigs and things that have fallen. And we understand what's going on under there. We understand what it would look like if we brush those leaves aside and that's decomposition. And then in the top right, we have what I know many of us do at home which is mulch. Now this looks like dyed mulch. I have nothing you know, necessarily against dyed mulch, um, but mulching, mulching works and is good for our soil because of the decomposition process. The bottom left, we have massive windrows and an industrial scale compost turner. Uh, it's a cool device. If you haven't ever seen one working, I, I, I highly recommend checking it out on YouTube. It is a huge, a huge tumble thing and it goes through it has big arms and they literally turn the compost um, massive machine and that's when if you buy a bag of compost or composted something from a big box store that is the facility that is producing it that's what they're doing um, we also have decomposition in the bottom right and this is prairie these are natural wildflowers and grasslands um, and nobody is there Nobody is managing that garden. Nobody is fertilizing yet. There are so many, just absolute, just square miles, thousands, thousands and thousands of, of beautiful wildflowers flourishing. And the decomposition when these living things die and return to the soil is the process that drives that. So let's talk about a better definition of composting. Um, let's think about composting as managed and directed decomposition. This is what we want. We want the once living things to break down, be disassembled in their constituent parts. And we want the nutrients that are locked in there to be made bioavailable through the decomposition process and through the activity of soil life, make those useful and usable for 
for the plants that were growing. Uh, decomposition is the unwinding via nutrient cyclers of the forward progression of the soil food web. It is the primary driving force behind dead matter cycling back into living matter. Um, nutrient cyclers. Nutrient cyclers can be lots of different things, and I think we're familiar with all of them. Uh, a, a great nutrient cycler, um, where I grew up, they're called potato bugs. Some people call them roly polies, the little gray arthropod guys with the shells. If you touch them, they roll up into a ball. Potato bugs, roly polies. Uh, there's there's other names for them. So that's a great one. Earthworms are great, but we also have um, saprophytic mushrooms, uh, mushrooms that live in trees. We see them flourishing on uh, tree stumps or on fallen logs. Those things are mechanically the tips of the uh, of the myc uh, mycorrhizae as they're going through the wood are mechanically digging into the wood fibers and splitting them apart to make water penetration happen or make that make that allowable and and they're a very very important part of the of the decomposition process we also have things like bacteria and there are great aerobic bacteria and there's also unfortunately anaerobic bacteria and the anaerobic bacteria which is something that we want to avoid while we're doing composting um, it, we kind of notice those based upon the smell anaerobic bacteria has kind of a kind of a sewage kind of a smell to it so we want to avoid that but those are still also nutrient cyclers they're things that work on this dead and decayed material and fold it back into something that can be used by living uh, by living things um, and again as i mentioned before this soil life these nutrient cyclers are the primary driving force behind the dead matter cycling back into living matter and so this is just an example. Um, this is a, a diagram of a soil food web, not the soil food web. It is a soil food web. This one happens to be from uh, New Zealand. I thought it was interesting uh, because it, it includes both uh, on the right uh, kiwis and hedgehogs. And then just not, not things that we have down here. Um, well, I wish we did. I guess I did. I don't know. Hedgehogs would be cool. Anyway, um, so we have different. Uh, the, the purpose of this is not is not really to have anybody memorize or or commit a food web diagram to memory. That doesn't really serve a purpose. It's just to understand that um, we see we see things on here moving in both directions, arrows moving back and forth. And the point is just to illustrate that the soil food web is connected and nutrients flow through it. And decomposition is one of the things at the very beginning, which we have towards the left of the soil food web, um, that kind of starts and kicks it off. So the decomposition provides nutrients for higher orders of life, and then they kind of, you know, trickle their way forward and eventually getting to us. <clears throat> the soil food web uh, and its nutrient cycler Engine. So a tree falls in the woods. Now, again, the, we, we already know how decomposition works. And so in that way, we already understand how composting works. And so if I asked you to just do just a little, a little thought experiment here, let's take a look at this fallen tree. What do we know about this fallen tree? Well, I, I can kind of see that it's that it's rotting, it's falling apart. Um, probably these white patches that are on it are due to fungal activity. It looks like there's maybe some whitish light gray lichen growing to the left near what it looks like. Is that like poison oak? Maybe somebody let me know if that's poison oak. Um, but we understand what's happening there already. What happens? If we turn the log over, what do you see when that happens? What is it like under that log? We already understand what's going to be under there. It's going to be cool and damp. It's going to be packed with life. We know there's going to be earthworms. There's going to be beetles munching away at the wood. We know there's going to be roly polies under there. Maybe some centipedes, maybe some millipedes. What's the soil under that going to be like? It's going to be moist. It's going to be cool. 
it's probably also going to be rich in black. It's going to probably be beautiful soil. We might find more leaves, more damp leaves under it in various stages of decomposition. Maybe some will fall apart in your hands. But we understand that already. And what we're doing when we're composting is we're taking that, that thing that we all kind of fundamentally get, we see how it happens, we're familiar with it already. And we're just gonna kind of put it in a little, maybe a wire mesh cube in the backyard. That's what we're gonna do. So a tree falls in the woods and nature gets to work. That's what happens. Um, we have bacteria on the left. In the center, we have one of my favorite uh, insects to find the patent leather beetle, a native of Virginia. Uh, they're pretty active. They're huge. They're about as big as, a, big as your thumb. Relatively huge for Virginia. And uh, they scream when you pick them up. They're very weird. And then on the right, we have uh, saprophilic mushrooms, um, turkey tails, delicious. Um, and they're taking down a log. They're slowly, they're slowly breaking down that log. Um, So why are we actually composting? Well, there's a lot of reasons somebody might want to compost, right? But why are we doing this in the first place? Well, I, I don't have to compost. I mean, I do in my context because compost is a huge part of what drives the fertility plan for our market garden. But I also need to compost because I had to do something with all of the, shall we say, used straw from our chicken coop. That has to go somewhere. Um, Many of us have lots of dried leaves in our yard in the fall, or if you're not mulching your grass clippings, maybe you have bags of grass clippings, and I, I would love to take those from you uh, if you, for whatever reason, decide um, to bag your grass clippings. But the real reason that, that we're composting, and so this, is, this touches back on why or, or our definition of decomp of composting as a form of, of decomposition. It's not, it's not a fertilizer, but it's for, it's a soil amendment that promotes the health and growth of the soil life. And that kind of, you know, fuels the things that we're trying to grow. So again, it's a great fertilizer, isn't it? And what I've constructed here um, is a, <laughs> is a skewed graph with bright colors, uh, for sensational effect. Um, what we have on the left side of this table is uh, common amendments or fertilizers. And to the right, we have their typical macronutrient. Uh, this is a, a percentage by weight, their typical macronutrient content. Um, macronutrient content, you can see it's the NPK. If we have something like a bag of fertilizer, there will be three numbers located prominently on it somewhere. Um, those three numbers are what we're talking about as those, those are, those three numbers are, are the mic, the macronutrient content in them, uh, typically nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in that order. So a common, uh, a common fertilizer that we might have this, uh, miracle grow I have at the top, the bag would say 24, 8, 16. Um, if we have an organic fertilizer like bone meal, uh, 3.5, 18, and zero. Uh, we go down through there for other common things. Melorganite, a great fertilizer and deer repellent um, for lawns, especially 640. Um, and we have common manures, chicken, rabbit, chicken. Again. Uh, no. All right. So hopefully it's recording correctly still, and, and this will be available for everybody. But as long as, as long as we can keep uh, everybody else can keep hearing. Okay, we're going to keep going. Does that, does that sound okay? If we lose me again, if somebody could just jump in and let me know, that would be great. Um, so we're going down again through the different uh, manures. The second manure is compost. The second version of chicken manure is chicken manure that has been composted. And we see that we see that the nutrient levels after it's been composted actually drop. And at the very bottom, we find compost with the lowest macronutrient availability. 
But if I asked you what would be the best way to plant all of the plants in your garden, if you could, in a dream, if you had unlimited compost, wouldn't you plant purely in unlimited compost? I certainly would. I think most of us would. How do we reconcile then that we have a very low macronutrient reading for compost when we consider it as a fertilizer, as the initial definition would have us do, versus a soil amendment? Oops, there we go. Compost fuels, this is, this is my one golden, you know, I have to get all of the nerdy terminology and, and condense it. And at some point it's going to happen. It's going to all be condensed into one difficult sentence. And this is the one for this talk. Compost fuels self-sustaining plant nutrient availability over extended periods by supporting the soil food web. What that jargon means, I had to condense it all into a single thing. It's my elevator pitch. Um, compost is made of plants. So we know that compost has everything in it that plants need. It's made of plants. It's the components in there were already successful plants. So all of the nutrients we need for more plants are, they're already in it. We get them. They're tied up in a form that other plants can't use yet. And so if we just, if we just jump back for a second, we see that just as an example, again, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in fresh chicken manure or in dried chicken manure without composting is higher than the chicken manure in, uh, that's been composted already. So would I want the fresh chicken manure or the composted chicken manure? I would definitely choose the composted chicken manure. And the reason is because of the way, it's, it's a little bit misleading, the way nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are often accounted for in or measured in fertilizers is through what is available in an aqueous solution to be measured. So how, e how rapidly or readily the fertilizer or amendment releases that into the water. And as long as we have life there over time, digesting these things and converting them into these available sources, we don't, we're not really concerned with the nitrogen, phosphorus, or potassium contained, or that they're able to release in a short term. We need it over a long term. That's how the life in the soil works. So we can kind of put, I think of it, uh, as a meal versus taking vitamins. You could take and condense everything a human body needs into one slurry and have your day's meal in a shake. There's some days I am busy and I wish I had one of those shakes. Most of the time, that idea is repulsive to me. Um, so what we're talking about with using compost to fuel the soil life and to fuel fertility in our soils, we're talking about feeding the plants a meal, whole meals made from whole foods versus using fertilizers, which are more of a vitamin. They can and do contain, I'm not knocking fertilizers in any way. They can and do provide essential nutrients, but they are never long-term solutions. Again, compost fuels self-sustaining plant nutrient availability over extended periods by supporting the soil food web. So what to compost and the many ways to make it happen. The secret ingredients for our recipe are any plant or plant-based matter, including yard and garden waste, vegetable kitchen waste, paper products like coffee filters and tea bags, newspaper, cardboard, uh, junk mail, waste products like herbivorous animal litters and manures. So there is an asterisk by any plant or plant-based matter. There are some considerations when you're working on building your compost pile and what should go in there, even if it is plant-based. So we have not black walnut or sunflower hulls because those uh, both contain compounds that inhibit the germination of seeds. Uh, if you have 
a bird feeder hanging in your backyard where the seeds fall underneath it if they habitually fall in the same spot and that spot gets filled with a lot of seeds you'll notice that there's likely no grass growing there uh, that's why it's from the sunflower hulls there are uh we unless you're very careful to reach high enough temperatures in your hot compost which will denature the proteins in many diseases or pathogens um keep diseased plants out i we hit those temperatures i don't feel bad we don't really have diseased plants but i wouldn't hesitate to put diseased plants in mine i recommend you don't unless you are monitoring the temperatures of your hot compost and then only in hot composting i would not put diseased plants in cold methods of composting um, don't put pest plants in there uh, heaven forbid, I don't even want to say its name, um, but if you have or are near or have seen the vine that is swallowing the south, heaven forbid, don't put any part of that anywhere near, we're talking about kudzu, don't put any, any part of that anywhere near compost. Fragments of the plant can reproduce, don't, just don't do it for years. They stay viable, don't do it. Also, um, poison ivy or poison oak, poison sumac. It's the same component in all of those. Arushiol and arushiol does not decompose. Arushiol stays active for long periods of time. So if you grind it up in a chipper or with a lawnmower and you add it and you don't touch it, it'll still be there when you're spreading it around. Heaven forbid, just spread around like radishes or something and then you just take a bite. Don't do that. Um, and definitely don't do treated debris. Um, I use pressure treated wood in specific applications and I am comfortable with it in those particular applications. Do not use pressure treated sawdust in your, or pressure treated wood scraps or anything like that, uh, or things that have pesticides sprayed on them or herbicides sprayed on them because those things can persist, um, particularly with things like, um, pressure treated wood, those compounds in there are their fungicides and their pesticides, and they will inhibit the life and growth in the compost. And we, we don't want to do that. So keep those things out. Um, skip these when making your mix. Animal-based products, other than manures, things high in proteins and fats, no meats, cheeses, or other dairy, oils of any kind, or human waste. There's an asterisk here again. Is this across the board? Uh, well, look, if it was alive once, we can get it to decompose. We'll turn, you know, ashes to ashes, right? So this, this will, these things will work. But why don't we want to do them? Um, Animal-based products in particular that are not manures will promote anaerobic activity, activity. They will stink. They will, they will be gross. They will be smelly. And they will attract, uh, aside from that deterrent, they will attract pests that we don't want in there. Things like rats or mice, raccoons coming to mess with your stuff, flies, maggots. We don't want those kinds of things near our compost piles or disturbing them while they're working. Um, no meats, cheeses, or other dairy or oils of any kind. Again, this is because it's going to smell. The oils can inhibit some of the life, but more importantly, rancid oil. I hope you've never experienced it. Uh, spoiled cheeses or dairy, spoiled meats. Don't put them in there unless you're prepared to deal with the smell. Um, composting of losses at cattle farms is a viable way of those farms to deal with, with losses without while being able to avoid storage or disposal fees in other words if we had a cow that we lost or had to be put down for disease or for some reason composting that in a very specific situation following very specific guidelines is a valid way to deal with that so these things can be composted but just just don't and what about human waste I mean, why, why wouldn't that be a problem? I mean, urine is very high in nitrogen. It's very, very active. If we have a lot of high carbon stuff in our hot compost pile, why couldn't we just maybe, you know? Not that I've thought about it, and I know none of you have thought about it either, but 
maybe. So the true issue is there's a grossness factor. Okay. It doesn't happen at my farm. Obviously it doesn't happen at any farm you would buy food from. I'm sure. But the real problem is not actually the gross out factor. The real problem is the human body. The human body is a very hazardous place for foreign invaders. It's a very hazardous place for things that are not naturally produced within it. And one of those things are medications. And so when pharmaceutical companies are designing medications, they design them to be as resilient as they possibly can to survive things like our stomach acid, our digestive system, the life in our gut, for them to make it to our liver where they're processed into their usable form or in directly into our bloodstream. And those things do not break down in the composting process. And so what we want to do with those things is we want to leave those out. We don't need, for example, antidepressants making it through the composting process and getting into our tomatoes or, you know, maybe we do. I don't know. I, I'm not trying to talk about that, but that that's what the concern is with that. And so those persistent um, medications going out into the wild, into the ecosystem can have, can have damaging effects. We don't want, we want to end that cycle. So let, let's not put those in there, in there either. So to make compost, let's take all the stuff we just talked about, which is most things, most not gross things, I guess we could say in a way, make a pile, wait a while, and then compost. It's as easy as that, isn't it? No, it's not. Oh, uh, yes, it is. That will absolutely work. That works just fine. That totally works. That's what happens in, in the forest. That's what happens in the grassland. That's, that's how those things work. Stuff falls over time. Waiting happens by the trees for those nutrients that they drop from their leaves to return back to them. Composting is happening there. Decomposition is happening there. That absolutely works. What we're talking about in, in how we manage our compost systems is how to make that process fit our context and how to make that decomposition process give us the results that we want. And we want it to happen in ways that we're just frankly willing to do. So I am willing to maybe multiple times a week turn cubic yards of composting materials maybe you're not that's great but what we're going to need to do is going to be a different thing so how do we compost um, this is the table that i mentioned earlier um, composting methods and overview what we want what i want you to take away from this is basically that there are lots of ways to compost and there are lots of different dimensions by which we may measure what forms of compost would best suit our particular contexts. So we have uh, going down the left column, we have composting methods. And then across the top, we have different dimensions. R red for the average person will be least desirable qualities and greens, darker green being the highest um, favorable qualities. So. Um, just an example, uh, let's say, uh, let's see, we have high composting. So the time to completion is the shortest. It'll only take roughly weeks, depending on how frequently you turn it. The nutrient quality is high. It's not sitting out in the elements for months and months and months. And so all of the nutrients are still relatively available. You get about 80% on your uh, return on what you get, what you put in. It is, however, high effort, which may be, a negative for some people, uh, probably for a lot of people. The yield is the highest. Again, you get about an 80% return on your investment there. Um, there are no special tools or materials required. The space required, a, it's worth doing about a cubic yard. So a space three feet by three feet by three feet. That is where the heating up really starts to work well. Um, Although once, once your composting process has begun, once it is actively heating up, adding new things to it can't happen. So while that's working, you might need a second pile to start to deal with whatever compostables, if you're using kitchen scraps, for example. Um, but there is no upper limit there. Again, this is how commercial compost is produced. So on massive scales. 
it does eliminate pathogens and it does denature weed seeds if done correctly. If the temperatures are high enough, it will successfully do those things. It is also relatively common. So if you wanted to look up tips on how to do it well, you have resources readily at your disposal. Uh, I would also like to point out that hot compost thing is also the only thing on here that successfully dependably eliminates pathogens and denatures weed seeds. Nothing else really does that. Some anti-pathogenic qualities can happen with Bokashi composting, which is almost in a strange way. It's an anaerobic process similar to pickling. Um, very interesting. You might want to check that out. Um, and there can be, because of pH fluctuations in Bokashi while it's happening, some weed seed denaturing, but typically not. Um, so that's how we read this. And this is, again, this is a thing I'd, I'd like to make available for you on my website or, or uh, maybe Judith can, can hook us up with that on the Botanical Garden site. So if we think back to the fallen tree and, and now we're, we're starting to kind of zero in on, ha on hot composting. We think back to the fallen tree, that's just happening out there. A tree falls, all those leaves fall and they're just kind of in a pile out there and that's fine. So let's say we're bagging our grass clippings. What happens if we just leave the grass clippings in a pile in August in the sun? after a thunderstorm. Has anyone experienced that? I hope not. What happens is you, you get the very distinct smell at first, and it happens rapidly in, even in, in hours, overnight, by the next day, a somewhat sickly sweet smell starts to happen. And then that quickly goes not from not not from the sickly sweet fresh grass clipping smell to a composting smell, but to a rotting smell. And anaerobic activity takes over there, and that is the smell is no bueno. Let me tell you, it's bad. They heat up rapidly. They get slimy and gross, and they stink, and you can smell it across the yard. Do not pile up fresh grass clippings and leave them out. The reason that happens is the relative ratios of carbon to nitrogen present in the grass clippings. And that carbon to nitrogen ratio is dramatically different in those fresh grass clippings than it is in the fallen leaves and tree in the forest. There's relatively little nitrogen in the tree and there's relatively high nitrogen in the grass clippings. And so this is where I find people get lost on composting. And this loses me, absolutely. Um, I have another extremely biased uh, table for you all. So the greens, when, when we talk about composting, typically everybody talks about greens and browns. And we're mixing these, these relative greens and browns. You add a little bit of greens and you add some browns and then hot compost happens. Well, how much greens and how much browns do you add to get this hot composting to happen? Well, you have to look at the chart and then the chart is filled with all of these numbers and ratios. And then you get to do a lot of math. And I don't know about you, but in the middle of the day, I'm trying to do yard cleanup and I have these you know, piles I'm just looking at this refreshing beer waiting for me over the side for when I'm done. I don't want to sit down and do math. I don't want to stop what I'm doing, pull out a notepad and a pen and start writing down equations to figure out how to get the compost pile just right. And so a lot of people get lost here. And if you are running a composting company, if that is what you're doing and that is your, that's your industry, then you need to know these things. You really do. But if you're in my particular context or in a home gardener context, it's absolutely not necessary. So we have browns on the right, things with relatively low carbon to, or high carbon, low nitrogen ratios. On the left, we have greens with typically high nitrogen, lower carbon ratios. But it depends who you ask. 
So if we, I mean, we see discrepancies on here. So I would, I would very confidently say that wood ash is a brown. I would consider that a brown. But the ratio of carbon to nitrogen there's 25 to one. If we look over on the left, we have vegetable scraps. It's also about 25 to one. Why is one of those considered a green and the other one considered a brown? This table does not help, but this is lifted directly from a composting website. This is where people get lost. Don't worry, trust me, I will help you. We will figure this out. I've just made everything worse. I've added a bunch of colors to everything and, and I think this is a huge problem. So what I've done is actually provided the normal color of the things. So even though it's green, coffee grounds are brown. If you have a pile of coffee grounds and we're working closely with the bake shop, new bakery downtown uh, from the amazing people that brought you the Amber Ox and uh, Precarious, the beer hall. Um, they have an amazing bake shop. We get all their coffee grounds. I'm happy to be a part of that. And we take those coffee grounds. We use them as a great nitrogen source, particularly in the winter where there are a few other, few other available nitrogen sources. But the tea bags also, manures. Manures will heat up. They will get very hot because they are high in nitrogen. But manures, we all know, I guess, I, well, I would hope we think at least they're brown. Um, healthy soil, adding soil to the compost pile, totally legit. Obviously, soil is not urine we have down there. Again, I know some of you have thought about it. Don't. But obviously, urine is not green. Well, depends on what you did for St. Patrick's Day. But anyway, um, and then on the brown side, eggshells, wood ash, um, fruit waste. Fruit waste, we're talking typically about peels, like orange peels. Uh, we're talking about... Uh, the pits, seeds, stems, those kinds of things. Shredded newspaper or your junk mail are great sources of carbon for composting. We have straw, another great source. Evergreen leaves. What? Who has an evergreen magnolia? Those leaves are green and they will never decompose ever. They are so high in carbon. They need so much nitrogen to get them to decompose. They, they stay glossy on the ground for years. But they're green. And this is confusing. And I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to confuse you even more here. This is part of what I'm doing. Again, this is biased. Uh, I've uh, created another version of the same table that is intended to frighten you even more through additional bias. And what I've done here is I've grayed out the things that most people don't have access to. And when I highlight or bold or embolden the things that most people have access to, they're, they're like the opposite. We have pine needles, which are green. We have those evergreen leaves, which are green. Evergreen leaves, not just, not just the, the giant evergreen magnolias. We're also talking hollies. Hollies are everywhere here. Those, they're basically the same type of leaf. The things people have most access to are some of the most confusing things to try to balance when we're talking about hot composting. So let's Let's figure out a better way to understand what greens are when we say greens, because I don't think right now we're able to completely break the composting system, the system down and get people to stop calling them greens and browns. I don't know what we would call them anyway, but greens and browns are typically, uh, does everybody know who that is? I'm not going to say, but it's a funny joke if you know who that is. Um, greens are typically things that are fresh as in recently alive or recently produced, fresh, grass clippings, coffee grounds are freshly produced or recently produced. They're typically soft. They're typically wet, again, soft and wet, both being parts of the recently being alive thing. Um, vegetable scraps are a perfect example of this. Fresh grass clippings, again, supple, they're flexible, they're bendable, they're pliable. So we might have a green thing if we go to try to bend it and it breaks, no go. A great example of that will be, again, an old magnolia leaf, one of these evergreen magnolia leaves. If you try to bend it, it's, it's going to break before it bends. Whereas if you imagine a blade of grass and bending that, it's going to be different. Browns are typically 
Do you know who that is? Come on, you got to know who that is. Browns are typically stale, hard, dry, and brittle. Like a great example of browns would be, I don't know, like a composting presentation, for example. Uh, something stale like uh, old grass clippings. So we have fresh grass clippings and old grass clippings. We picture old grass clippings. That's what hay is. That's what straw is. They're old, old grass clippings. They're these fresh things that have been dried. When the moisture leaves them, their compositions change and they lose a lot of that nitrogen through just off gas as they dry out. Things that are hard, twigs, sticks, things that are dry, newspaper, cardboard. Uh, if we have the corrugated cardboard, I don't know how many people have been taking advantage of Amazon deliveries throughout this pandemic, but um, we have an abundance of cardboard in my house. The corrugated cardboard, the corrugations are created and sandwiched uh, when, when the lamination occurs with the flat paper sides, um, they use typically a starch-based glue and earthworms love that. You will attract so many earthworms. If you can get that cardboard, tear it up into some pieces, maybe try running it over with the lawnmower. Do not run it over with your lawnmower. I don't want you to break your lawnmower, but I, that's what I do. Run it over your lawnmower, get it into a finer, a finer tilt, get it into your compost pile. Earthworms, um, brittle things, brown pine needles, for example. Things, things that when we go to try and break them or, or try to bend them, they, they break and turn to dust. Eggshells. So we have carbon, which we talked about in our browns. We have nitrogen, which we talk about in our greens. Green things are typically fresh, soft, wet, or supple, and they are very high in nitrogen relative to how much carbon they have. Browns are typically stale, hard, dry, or brittle. They have relatively low amounts of nitrogen relative to carbon. So we have carbon and nitrogen on the left. Now our two knobs remaining are water and oxygen. So how do we, how do we put this all together? When we increase carbon by adding browns, it's a great way to increase carbon. We slow down the composting process. Nitrogen is a very significant component in the structure of cells for the bacteria, fungi, protozoa that fuel the composting and decomposition process. And if we limit the amount of nitrogen that goes in, we limit the amount of, of life that can grow, particularly the thermophilic fun, uh, the thermophilic life in a hot compost pile. Those things are very much driven by the amount of nitrogen. And so we can slow down that growth by adding carbon. When we add carbon, that partially increases the bulk of the composted material. If you put a bunch of wood chips in there, you're gonna get a lot more material out than if you had something that had lower levels of carbon in it or that wasn't as bulky like grass clippings. If we could somehow get grass clippings in a pile to decompose, that would shrink down kind of a lot. The bulking material, a great way to bulk that up and to help get out more in the end from what you put in would be to add wood chips. And that's one of my favorite things to do. Um, carbon can absorb excess moisture so they can prevent something from getting too wet. Um, and the net effect again of adding carbon is cooling of a hot compost. If you are trying to do hot composting and you're trying to turn your compost pile, uh, if it's not heating up, you get what's called a stalled compost. If it's wet, the first thing that went wrong with it was the carbon, just too much carbon in it. Too much of the browns, too many dry things, too many brittle things, too many uh, crispy leaves, those kinds of things. When we increase nitrogen, which we do by adding greens. This speeds the composting process. That nitrogen, again, is a very important part of what goes on with the wall, the cell walls and cell structures of all of the, the bacteria, the fungi, and protozoa that are really fueling, particularly the thermophilic bacteria that are, that are really driving the composting process. They really need that nitrogen. If we add it in there, we make it available for them and their colonies explode. 
Adding nitrogen typically speeds up the composting process. It does not generally increase bulk. These are soft, typically soft, supple, fresh, wet things. That moisture typically goes somewhere. And what is left at the end is a relatively small amount of stuff. We know high percentages of growing things are water. And when that water goes, there's not, not a whole lot left. Um, therefore, it does not generally increase bulk. It does because they are typically fresh, recently living. They do typically have a water content. Uh, so they do provide some moisture. And if you have a stalled compost, what ends up happening is that if you add nitrogen to it, you will create that habitat that will allow for an explosion in that soil life and the, the nutrient cyclers, and that'll, that'll help heat up a cold compost. We had too much nitrogen, you end up with a smelly compost. And the extreme example of that is the grass clippings. If you have a pile of grass clippings, they stink. The pile doesn't even really have to be that big. If you get, if you get a pile about this big, you could probably smell it. If, it, if you're doing it in the summer, absolutely. Um, and it's a combination of things. It is a combination of, it's not that there's necessarily too much nitrogen, but it is actually more about where that nitrogen comes from. That nitrogen comes from typically a supple source, which is something that can pack down. And when that packing down happens, we're excluding oxygen, which we'll talk about in a second, but it's also wet and that moisture excludes oxygen. And that's when that absence of oxygen, that anaerobic thing happens. And that's where we get the funky smell from. Water, carbon, nitrogen, water, oxygen. Again, it's at the bottom of every single slide. What happens when we increase water? We're talking about adding moisture to the compost pile. If you have a good amount, and I would absolutely tell you how to figure this out. If you have a good amount of nitrogenous material in your compost and you have enough carbon material in there also and you think everything is right just check it out get your hand in there is it dry and crumbly shouldn't be add some water water obviously is necessary for all life um, it typically doesn't increase bulk obviously because it goes away into the atmosphere uh, it can help heat up a cold compost it is essential for supporting microbiota and that's why when we have a stalled compost if the nitrogen and carbon levels are where they should be. And again, I will sh absolutely show you in just a moment how to figure that out for yourself. It is super simple. Um, the absence of water is what I would check next. Is it too dry? Um, too much of it leads to smelly compost. And this again is in part with, uh, is in part due to how the too much nitrogen in compost can lead to smelly compost. When we're adding water, we're excluding oxygen. You can't, like, that's just, that's just how it works. You can't, you can't have one without the other. It's, it's when water goes in or you have one without the other, it's ne it necessarily works that way. When we add water in, it is taking up space that is excluding oxygen. And that lack of oxygen promotes an anaerobic system. And that is where the funk comes from. Increasing airflow, adding oxygen. How do we increase airflow? Are we talking about putting fans on the compost? Are we talking about putting the compost pile in a windy spot? No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the, the number one, there's two, two huge ways to add oxygen to the compost. The most common way to do it is to turn the compost pile. That's what we're doing. We're, we're exposing it to oxygen and to air, fluffing it up a little bit as, as we turn it. And that inrush of air during that physical turning process of the composting uh, is what will add a lot of the oxygen. Another way to add oxygen is to include a lot of it at the beginning. So really fluff everything up as you're adding it to the compost pile. Uh, it is essential for aerobic activity. The thermophilic life in the compost pile that makes the hot compost hot is aerobic. There has to be oxygen in there for it to work. Otherwise it cools off, goes anaerobic, and we get funk. Not the good kind of funk. Can help heat up cold compost. If your compost has stalled, the moisture and the mixture is right, try turning it. If you don't turn it because you're missing oxygen, if the compost and the nitrogen are right and the moisture is right, it's gonna smell anyway because the oxygen, the lack of oxygen is going to contribute to an anaerobic compost. 
um, can fix a smelly compost. The smell again, as we just said, anaerobic composting is funky. You can fix a smelly compost by turning it more, turning it more frequently. Typically an, an anaerobic compost pile that's hot is going to be too wet and there's gonna to be too many greens. A great way to convert those greens to browns is to allow them to dry out. For example, again, grass, hay, that's what it is. Um, too, much, too much oxygen can lead to a stalled compost. And that happens because turning it too frequently, the moisture levels, moisture levels will drop. And so this, it's this balancing act that we're trying to do, but the balancing act is very simple to achieve. So when do I turn the pile? How frequently? And when is this thing done? We're in the home stretch. You're all going to be pros in just a few minutes, and I'm very excited for you all. Um, this is an example. This is to illustrate what the temperature looks like inside a hot compost pile. We see the temperature curve. What ends up happening is right when we start the pile and everything is fresh, we see a rapid temperature spike. Uh, right here, it looks like it's happening around five days. If you do a solid compost pile in the morning, by the time you go home, it will be warmer inside that compost pile than ambient temperature. It happens all the time. And it is always to this day still amazing to me when it happens. With a thermometer, that's how we're checking. You don't have to do that. You do not have to use a thermometer. I'm just saying, just for illustration purposes, we're checking with the thermometer. After that peak happens and the temperature starts to drop, in the trough after the peak is a turning day. That's when the compost pile is turned. We see an influx of oxygen at that time. Also, if we notice the compost is drying, we're going to add a little water. How much water? I'm going to tell you in just a minute, I promise. We see a small spike, but the temperature doesn't reach the same level as the previous spike. That will start to fade. We see another trough. That trough is when it's turned. Typically, by the time you get to C, the third bump in the temperature spike, it doesn't look like compost and it doesn't look like the materials you put in it anymore. It looks like compost. It is, as we're moving through composting time from left to right on the graph, what we're seeing is that these, it, it's starting to look also more like dirt and that's soil or, or finished compost. That's, that's what's happening. We're also monitoring for the temperature decrease, it's saying right around 30 days here. We're looking for that drop in temperature. So we know it's safe to use around plants. We don't want a hot compost going on to seedlings, for example. You will likely never have that problem. Recap, turn the pile when the temperature begins to drop off. Generally, two turns of the compost pile works great. I personally do three turns and then I allow it to mature under a tarp and then store it for a few weeks because that's what works best for me because I have a farm. I have a lot of space to do it. I have, I gain benefits from that. Uh, one of the benefits is that that third turn we just mentioned, or we just talked about how as composting time moves forward, we get this um, breakdown, physical breakdown of the structure. So after that third term, I get finer, finer compost, which is useful for me, especially in like starting seeds. Um, Allowing it to mature under a tarp and then storing it for a few weeks allows the, the nutrient cyclers to move in. Talking about pill bugs, ants, centipedes, millipedes, and especially earthworms. And I really want the earthworms to move in there. I want them to eat the stuff. I want their castings. I need them pooping that stuff out. And I also need them mating, laying their eggs, so that when I go and put that compost out into the field, I get earthworm eggs going. It's like an earthworm hatchery. It's, it's one of my favorite things. Um, is your compost cool to the touch? Are there nutrient cyclers like shredders moving in? Maybe some patent leather beetles going in there, trying to break down whatever might be left and scavenging for whatever they can. You got worms, your compost is ready to go. I will spare you all in not saying. I hope you know who that is too. Take me home compost roads. Um, Maybe it's my generation. I can't help but just include a silly picture from the internet of Cat uh, completing the lyrics to that song. I apologize for nothing. How to make a steaming pile. I'm going to add a layer of browns. 
So what are browns you might have? Uh, wood chips are great. Sawdust is great. Shredded paper, cardboard is great. Most of us, most of the time, will likely have leaves. Shredded leaves are better. An, a simple way, which I don't recommend you do because I don't want you to damage your lawnmower by hitting a, I don't know, rock or something. But a simple way might be use your lawnmower to grind up those, those fall leaves. It'll help them incorporate into the compost faster. Uh, bag them up, get them in the compost pile. Layer of browns. How big is the layer? I don't know, a couple of inches. We're trying to maximize the contact between the layers. A couple of inches brown, a couple of inches of greens. What are greens you might have? Throw your coffee grounds in there. Sprinkle the coffee grounds on there. If you're bagging your, uh, your lawn clippings, a couple of inches of lawn clippings on there, great. Add a splash of water. By splash of water, I mean wave. If you picture having like a watering can, wave the watering can so that droplets from the watering can hit every surface one time. This one even quick drizzle of water from the watering can and repeat and just keep stacking, stack and stack and stack until you reach the top of your, until you reach the top of your thing. It looks something, something like this. This is kind of what our composting cages look like. I got a layer of browns. I always start with a layer of browns because what will happen is nutrients will leak out and those browns at the bottom will absorb some of those nutrients and they will hold on to them and keep them there. So I always put browns at the bottom first to start the pile. You know, do whatever works for you. That's all we're doing, stacking them. If you get by volume that 50-50 mix where every other level is brown or green in the vast majority of, of cases, well over 90% of cases, if you're watering, just like I'm saying, just a little bit, just a quick pass over, over each level as you're stacking, that will heat up in a day and you are off to the races with your composting. That's all you got to do. Equal volumes, greens and browns. Easy peasy. We don't need to memorize charts. We don't need to memorize tables or ratios. That will work beautifully for you. It will heat up and begin decomposition rapidly. Uh, this is what hot compost looks like. You can see steam coming off it. We got a good mix in here of straw uh, and manure. That heat spike is what we're is what we're talking about. So some composting setups to do this. We have a cage on the right, um, and we have a super slick composting setup on the left. Um, the composting setup on the left, which is beautiful. We have, I, you know, I mentioned before, we have those bays um, because when we're, when we begin turning the compost pile, we don't want to be adding new material to it because we kind of reset the compost pile in a way when we do that. And so you just have, you could like those slats on the, in the image on the left, those kind of slide up for you to access it easily and they can slide back into place as the pile gets bigger. As we move from left to right, it looks like this is where this one's going. We can see there's some recognizable stuff in the leftmost bay, in the center bay. Things are looking a little bit more mixed up and partially decomposed. And in the right bay, we have what looks like beautiful finished compost. Um, for cold and as you go composting, uh, which is what a lot of people do, there is much less to worry about with those systems. And so I didn't spend a lot of time talking about them. Most people that are frustrated with cold and add as you go composting are frustrated because it has been sitting there for a long time and it's still not finished compost. And so what we want to do now is take those tools that we just discovered or that we just learned about rather and apply those to that compost. We want to make sure you know, what did you put in it? How much, what are the proportions of grass clippings, which is what it looks like here, or weeds uh, to hay or straw, which is what it looks like there is here. Is it about 50-50? Cool, maybe you just need to turn it because there's not enough oxygen. What if it's a little dry? Just add a little bit of water to it, but you're going to have to turn it. If you have a pile of shredded leaves in the back, what is missing from the composting process? It's nitrogen. 
There's no green material there to fuel the growth of the life, that microbiota that will digest those things. So they're just going to sit there very slowly over time, often years, eventually fungal activity, which is a cold process versus our hot composting process, will get to work on that over years, beetles, earthworms, pill bugs, ants, termites, they'll get in there and they'll do their thing, but it will take a long time. If we inject nitrogen and some moisture in there, the, the thermophilic life is waiting there for those things to activate them and it'll, it'll start up right away. What we were just talking about, the leaf pile, who has a leaf pile sitting in their backyard? It's been there for how long? Since Reagan? Common composting problems. So now we have this intuitive understanding. My compost isn't heating up. Why isn't it heating up? What are you missing? We have a cold compost pile. First thing to check, well, did you put enough greens in it? Are there too many browns in it? We're going to fix that first. Most of the time that fixes it right away. Is it too dry? Let's check that. Give it a sprinkle of water. Turn it. My compost is too hot. And what's going to happen right after it gets too hot? It's going to start to stink. Too hot is a, high, is a sign of too much moisture and too much nitrogen, which we all understand now. Too much nitrogen, too hot. How do we cool that down? You physically cool it down by turning it, sprinkling some, uh, some ground up leaves, maybe add some shredded uh, newspaper, maybe some junk mail. Um, it's hot and it seems to be working, but stuff isn't decomposing. Why would that be? There's a couple of reasons. One, uh, primarily you're at the you're on, you're on the back end of the last slope. Everything is done. The chunks are too big. You just you, you put big chunks of sticks. Like if you put a piece of stick in there, it's going to come out the other side as a stick still. You put a center piece of a log in there, put a piece of two by four in this, it's going to come out the other end into the shape of a two by four. So you're not going to have those large chunks ever really decompose in a meaningful amount of time, specifically with hot composting. It stinks. Well, why would it stink? It's, it's gone anaerobic. And why would it go anaerobic? We understand now. It will go anaerobic because there's not enough oxygen. The oxygen has been excluded. Why? Maybe too much moisture or maybe too many greens. Those greens are getting slimy and funky in there. How do we fix it? You can add more browns. You can cool it down. You can turn it if it's too much moisture. Dry it out. How do we know it's too much moisture? Listen. You're getting your pile together. You're stacking everything up. You're doing your layers, sprinkling with a little water. Think we're good. How do we test? You grab it, the pile of it in your hands, you squeeze it together. Is it wet? You're good. Is it dripping? It's too wet. Easy peasy. The range with which this will work beautifully is huge. But a lot of proponents of composting treat it as more of a narrow thing. The range for which this work is very wide. You don't have to be that precise and it will work. Just keep these, these kind of fundamentals in mind. So it stinks again, too much nitrogen or too much water. Simultaneously, those things tend to exclude oxygen. Maybe give it a turn. It's crawling with pests. Oh. Your compost pile is infested with ants and termites and pill bugs and earthworms and centipedes and millipedes and patent leather beetles. Oh, what's wrong with it? Nothing. You're done. Congratulations. You made a beautiful pile of compost that everything wants to live inside. You nailed it. Um, hopefully, I have helped everybody kind of uh, form more of an intuitive understanding of how this goes about how composting works and how to apply it to your own personal context. Uh, I am absolutely happy to answer any and all questions related to composting at excruciating length. I'd be more than happy to. So please uh, thank, thank you all so much for, for your attention. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. And uh, just some, some final res uh, resources for further research. 
Uh, again, my website is just mockingbirdfarmstead.com. I will have something up there for you. Uh, the, the table of different types of composting from before. I will also make happily make the, the presentation available. You always have your friends, the master gardeners at the Virginia Cooperative Extension. Um, Rodale Institute has kind of written the book literally on composting. Um, and they go into absolutely all of the charts and tables and numbers and ratios for you uh, if you're a numbers person. Uh, and then me, you have me as a resource too. Please reach out to me at any time, including right now. Ask away, please. Justin, thank you very much. Um, this is the second time that I have heard your composting program, and I always so, I'm so sorry that you that you had to do the no, no 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 no. That, I'm glad I did. I really am. Um, I learned a lot the first time. I learned even more the second time. Thank um, you. So thank you very much. So looking at the chat. Um, Abby, there was the question earlier when we were looking at the fallen mm. log and it was like, oh, was that poison oak? And Abby says, yes, it is poison oak. Uh, <laughs> okay. And then I, apolog you, I apologize because um, I got cat bombed and uh, she stepped on, on an <laughs> external mm. volume control. And so I apologize for interrupting. All right. Not at all. Not at all. Okay. So a question that came in is building a warm colony good for your plants and what's the best thing to feed worms because I'm building one. That's Abby who's okay. building that. Okay. One, one more time, please. Okay. The question. I, I was searching and I, I couldn't find it. Sure. Yeah. It's at the bottom. <clears throat> um, okay. It, is building a worm colony good for your plants and what what's the best thing to feed to worms because she's in she wants to know yeah absolutely um worm colonies are great we talk about worm colonies as a form of composting called vermicomposting um and boy would i love to do a talk about that um worm colonies are amazing um what we get in their uh in, in their manure, it's worm manure, um, is it is packed with soil life and easily accessible nutrients. So absolutely do it if you can. They take a healthy amount of management to make sure that the worms are happy and healthy. Um, when I am in the garden, obviously I'm happy to see worms. If I have a vermicomposting setup going, I consider them to be kind of work animals that are in my care. And it is critical to me that they live their best worm lives uh, like we do with our chickens. And if I'm unable to provide them with their best worm lives or best worm conditions, I, I, I don't wanna do it. Um, vermicomposting can be slow. If you are in a situation where you don't have a lot of space, you don't have a huge backyard, there are vermicomposting solutions for just like an apartment, you can throw your, your kitchen scraps in there, and the finished vermicompost, you can just throw right in the top, doesn't smell. But to do it successfully, it does require a healthy amount of maintenance and upkeep, and a particular breed of worms, often called red wigglers, are ideal for that regular earthworms that you might collect in your backyard are not going to, are not going to cut it. So definitely worm selection, worm varieties are important. I never thought I would hear myself saying <laughs> it's only a specific kind of worm will, will do. And I'm happy to talk more about that. I hope that helps. And uh, I look forward to the program that you develop on worm. That'd I would be love great. To, I would love to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. So then Anne asks, I have a small area are there containers you can buy to compost? And can you buy earthworms to add? Yeah, so you seem to have frozen. Um, hmm. uh, there, there are containers that you can have inside. Many of them have like a like a carbon filter at the top to avoid smells. Um, 
I don't dislike those. They tend to be made out of black plastic and we know what the summers are like here. So if you're keeping it in a shady location, I think it would be good to go. It keeps the compostables at a good height for you typically, uh, allowing you to get a bucket underneath to empty them. Um, but if we're talking about composting, uh, we're talking about the add as you go method. It's not gonna really be finished composting until you close it off and let it complete the composting cycle. And that leaves you with what to do with other compostables in the meantime. Additionally, that heating up, if it's not in the shade, is not going to be good for earthworms if you have them in there. Earthworms love the cool damp of soil. They are most happy somewhere around room temperature, a little cooler. If you put them in there, they're going to overheat and die. Um, you may or may not feel sad about the loss of earthworm life. I do. You might not. That's okay. Um, but it is definitely money going down the tubes. Uh, and if you are building in a small space outside, you're going to get the earthworms for free if you're on the ground. So I wouldn't worry about it. Okay. That's what I was thinking is that, you know, once you get going, the earthworms find you. They, they find your pile. Um, okay. So next question from Bill. Almost all my available greens are weeds. Boy, Bill, I'm, I'm there with you. Um, yeah. If that's the case, am I going to be adding more weeds to my garden when I use my compost? Hi, Bill. Great question. Uh, I love Bill. Uh, so <laughs> who doesn't love Bill, first of all? Anybody that's ever <laughs> met Bill loves Bill. We love Bill. Uh, we love Bill. Um, maybe, uh, maybe. So if we have a cold composting system, those weeds are going to be in there, particularly things like crabgrass. If those are your weeds, um, then those weed seeds are going to likely persist. You're going to put weeds in. You're going to get weeds out if you do a cold composting system. If you do a hot composting, composting system and you have those weed seeds in there, if you run the temperatures correctly, if you monitor it correctly, then you, you should be totally fine. That's what we do. Um, putting weeds in though, are they're only, so if you have the type of weed that has a rhizomatous habit, like a creeping grass of some type, if that's not ground up, those may survive the process if it's not hot. But if it's not in the flower or seed making stage of its life, you're likely not going to get those weeds back out. So we're really just, we're talking about worrying about weeds making it through. We're talking more specifically about weed seeds or weeds that propagate vegetatively. They're not, weeds of ve that propagate vegetatively are not as common in terms of surviving the composting process. But if we're not doing hot composting, that would absolutely be a concern for me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So basically, though, what I've gotten out of out of this is that if you get to the end, let's say you're you know, 30 to 45 days or whatever, and you've got nice crumbly compost, mm -hmm. the seeds basically should have been fried out of existence. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Okay. All righty. Uh, let's see. We have thank you. And Elaine asked, how can we contact you? Elaine will be adding in the follow-up email. We will have all of J uh, Justin's contact info. Um, so there's that. Um, many compliments. Thank you. Well done. Thank ah, you so much. One more question. Is compost mm -hmm. pet friendly? Is compost pet friendly? Uh, so um, our we have multiple plots around town. One of our plots uh, is on a friend of ours. They have a lot of land. It's at, it's at their place. They have a puppy and he loves going into the compost. <laughs> he loves going into the compost. So it is extremely pet friendly. Um, <laughs> but but it, it would not hurt them. We're talking about say, I understand. Yeah, we're talking about the safety and the, there, there are no issues for a completed compost. Now, if we had a composting a hot composting setup in particular that has gone awry and we have that high nitrogen, high moisture, low oxygen thing where we have anaerobic bacteria. That's the kind of bacteria like we're talking about gut bacteria, anaerobic conditions. Those can be nasty bugs that we don't want to consume. So properly composting hot compost or any cold compost is as dangerous as whatever you put in it. So uh, if we put 
sticks and twigs in it. It is as dangerous for a pet as those sticks and twigs. If we're talking about you've put poison ivy or some noxious weeds in it, you know, dogs are not sensitive necessarily to poison ivy, but they can bring the arushiol into your house on their fur mm. and then spread mm. it to you. And you're just wondering where it came from. So, so that's a thing, but um, no, we're, uh, we, you know, we're worried. Uh, I, I guess the other thing would be like uh, garlic, for example. So if you, if you had like a, uh, a head of garlic that you put in your kitchen compost thing because it got a little mold on it or something like that, or it dried out over time or whatever, and that goes whole into the compost pile, then yeah, I would worry about, for example, a dog, or if you put chocolate candies or something like it, like that in there, but that's, that's what I'm saying. It's only as dangerous as to the pets as the stuff that you would put in there. So if you put things into it that are dangerous to pets, before they fully composted, they will they will remain dangerous. Okay. To pets. Mm. So yeah. that's that's it. After they're fully composted, they have they're they're in their constituent parts and they're no longer a concern. I hope that I hope that makes sense. Okay. Abby asked, are we going to be on Zoom next time? Yes, Abby. Uh, and you will you will be now be on our email list. So you will find out what is happening next. Last question. What if maggots mm -hmm. get into the pile? Um, ma maggots in and of themselves are not necessarily a problem. But, but I, my first thing would be where, my first question would be, why are there maggots there? So we know flies are attracted to certain kinds of things. There's an expression uh, about flies pro proclivity for uh, their attraction to Manure. Uh, I would I would wonder why those why those maggots would be there. That would my, that would be my biggest concern because typically in 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 my experience, maggots are maggots are indicative of a presence of some anaerobic type thing or something like high protein like meat decomposing in there. Mm. Um, an absence of oxygen, an excess of moisture, those kinds of things that would not be otherwise good for the compost pile can lead to a symptom like maggots. And that's, that's what my interest would be. Flies on there in and of themselves, not an issue. Maggots on there in and of themselves, also not an issue. Okay. So <clears throat> Anne said, thanks, Justin. She's encouraged to try again. And <clears throat> Bobman, I think I'm going to let that comment go and let you contact Justin directly. And Kathy said, I have eight compost bins and I'm always learning something. So I think we're going to call it. We're actually a little bit past. Well, yeah. yeah, we're a little bit past our time, but thank you to everyone who has hung in with us to the, this very, very end. Uh, Justin, as always, Thank you so much. And I truly am looking forward to a worm program. <laughs> <laughs> we will, I will, I'll get right on it. I will get All right. right on it. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend. Take care. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye.